I think so. Okay. Um, many thanks to the uh, Center for Governance Markets for um, uh, sponsoring this series. Uh, it's been very exciting uh, so far and uh, very much looking forward to uh, today's talk, um, So, uh, which I hope you'll get a lot out of. Um, our guest is uh, Megan Stevenson. Um, uh, Megan is an economist and criminal justice scholar. She has conducted empirical research in various areas of criminal justice reform, including bail, algorithmic risk assessment, misdemeanors, and juvenile justice. Our research on bail was cited extensively in landmark federal uh, civil rights in the landmark federal uh, civil rights decision of Donald B. Harris County, and has received widespread media coverage. She is an associate professor of law at the University of Virginia. So. Um, please, uh, did everyone get this handout as well? There's, we got more of these um, that will be part of today's uh, talk. And so with that, please join me in welcoming uh, Megan Stevens. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, I've been to Pittsburgh before, but I, I feel like I haven't really spent time here. And I'm walking around just kind of blown away by the scale and the grandeur of everything that I see, especially this big, gigantic, you know, Art Deco Gothic building that apparently you guys all take classes in and have your offices in. So um, it's really fun to be here. So I, uh, as, as you said, I'm a you know a law professor and economist. I've been studying uh, algorithms in in criminal justice for a number of years. And I the, the the my goal for the the talk today is to kind of give you a kind of big picture overview uh, type uh, perspective on some of the the issues. Uh, related to the use of algorithms in criminal justice, as well as kind of do a little bit of a deep dive into a couple of of, uh, of interesting areas. So um, I'm hoping that this can be kind of more of a conversation rather than me just standing up here talking the whole time. So I am very used to people interrupting me from the get go. I am, like I said, I'm an economist. You know, like usually you know, people people in the back with the little the little dart guns, you know, <laughs> shooting them at me from from get go. So 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 feel free anytime you're just like. I have a thought, I have a comment, you know, we're here for a chunk of time. I am personally the type of person that I get a little bored listening to someone talk for too long. So I'm hoping it can be a little bit more, uh, more interactive. All right, so um, let's just go over a, a little bit about what these things are. So, you know, risk assessments are statistical predictions of misconduct. And misconduct can mean a variety of different things. It can mean failure to appear in court, it can mean rearrest, it can mean reconviction. Now, of course, you know, notice that, uh, you know, particularly with those uh, those last couple of items up there, you know, I don't have crime written on the board, right? We don't have any data on crime because crime is generally something people want to conceal. You know, like they're not going around talking about their crime. Like you only have a proxy for crime, which is rearrest or reconviction and even failure to appear in court. Although that's something that's not hidden. You know, you know, if the person was supposed to appear in court and they don't show up. The data set that we're working with kind of depends on whether the judge decides to, you know, uh, to mark somebody down as having failed to appear or to give them a pass, you know, on the presumption that it was just a mistake, they'll come back next time. So these are all proxies for the things that we care about, you know, some some type of misconduct, but they're they're imperfect proxies for a variety of reasons. So risk assessments are really used very broadly in criminal justice. So I'm, I'm going to be talking today specifically about these risk assessments used um, in, in bail sentencing, in uh, determining kind of the, the level of probation uh, intensity, the conditions of probation, uh, prison placement, parole, and so forth. Of course, there's, you know, algorithms and technology used in a variety of different criminal justice settings. You know, there's also kind of uh, facial recognition systems used by police. I'm not so much talking about policing or investigation, more just decisions about how the system should treat somebody once they've 
they've been arrested and, and charged. So a little bit of, of background. So uh, these risk assessments actually go surprisingly far back uh, to 1923 is kind of recorded as the first year somebody came up with this idea and suggested this idea of, of using risk assessments. And this is you know a, a quote taken directly from the original paper. Will Smith has a, this is how he's suggesting it should be done. Will Smith has a prognostic score, the early phrase for risk assessment, of 21 points. In the past experience of the board among men with prognostic scores close to 21 points, 89% have violated their parole. Um, so this kind of arose in a particular moment in time and has kind of roots both in um, you know, early mathematical statistics and uh, early criminological theory, a lot of which is really, frankly, totally awful. <laughs> this is very kind of informed by a eugenicist set of beliefs and a, a, you know, kind of an Italian positive school of, of criminology where you know, one, of, one of the things they were trying to do is identify these kind of malfeasance, these people who are so deficient in mentality as to be unable under the most favorable circumstances to succeed in the battle of life. Um, and so the idea, and so, so Hart is very you know, straightforward. He's like, ideally sterilization is the, you know, is the cure for these malfeasance, but to the extent that self, you know, um, uh, sterilization is politically unfeasible, we'll just have permanent penal colonies, right? <laughs> Where we send these people you know, to live, live forever. Um, you know, obviously this is, you know, when you, when you look at it in this context, it's, it's very disturbing, you know, that people don't use these language anymore, but, but there's still at its core, some really deep, complicated, tricky questions about the idea of using predictions of reoffending to incarcerate someone that should give everyone pause. And, and it does in fact give, give many people pause when they think about that. Um, you know, the idea of incarcerating somebody, not on the basis of what they've done, but on the basis of what they might do in the future, which of course is, you know, inherently, uh, inherently unknown. Um, and so that, you know, that this is, he, you know, he came up with this in the 20, uh, 1923, started being used in parole in 1934. Um, it spread uh, kind of civil commitment, I think, is the next big area where it, it was, um, uh, it was, it was growing in the 1970s. So civil commitment, by the way, is, it is literally the idea of incarcerating somebody like you don't even have to have ever done a crime before, but if you are mentally ill and you are dangerous, the state has the capacity to just say, okay, well, you know, you get locked up in a quote hospital, but the hospitals are basically, you know, they're more like jails than anything else. And then it moved into bail in, in the 1990s and, you know, has since become a, a real staple, a real dominant part of how decision-making is done at, you know, like I said, pretty much every phase of, uh, of the criminal process. Um, you know, and so the, the, the reason why people like them, it's a variety, and here's just a handful of the kind of most commonly cited goals, you know, the things that, that these things are supposed to achieve. Uh, you know, what, one is just kind of this idea of efficiency, you know, that we, we can reduce crime by incarcerating those at highest risk of reoffending. So you can identify those people who wouldn't be committing crime, you can let them go home, you, you, you know, take the ones that would be committing crime, you lock them up. Uh, therefore, you're kind of more you're using uh, you know the 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 resource of incarceration in a way that kind of reduces crime maximally. Uh, so that's one ideal. You know, the the other one is reducing idiosyncratic human variation. You know, people vary a lot. People, you know, the, the your, your you know your your sentence, your bail, your whatever varies a lot just based on the human being that you get. And there's something that just feels kind of you know unfair or arbitrary about that. That risk assessment could reduce. Um, and at least theoretically, you know, it could reduce uh, racial bias and other types of bias, you know, because you, you can control the inputs into the risk assessment um, in a way that you can't control the inputs into, you know, the human risk assessment, the human process of determining who's likely to commit crime in the future. Of course, so that's that's the kind of like, that's the, that's the pro side for risk assessment. These are the benefits that people are hoping that they would bring. But there's also some real, real concerns. Um, you know, one I've already mentioned is this idea that risk assessments by and large are used in the criminal justice system to take away someone's freedom, to lock them up, to make them, you know, uh, put them under more intensive probation surveillance, to put them in a higher security prison, whatever it is, to give them higher bail. And, you know, making these decisions on the basis of, of things you haven't done yet and speculations of what you might do in the future is controversial and, and you know, should, should uh, you know, should make, should make you feel concerned. Um, the flip side is, if we are already doing that with a judge making, you know, making these calls, then, you know, the, 
you know, th then the question becomes not should we do this at all, but should we do this with a judge or, uh, you know, or with an algorithm. Um, there's also concerns about making inference about one particular person would do based on their membership in, in a class, in a group of people that share similar characteristics. You know, uh, you are a, a person of a particular gender uh, and a particular age, you know, with a particular marital status and a, a particular employment status. And what these risk assessments says is that because of your membership in this group, you have XYZ recidivism risk. Now, statistically, there's a lot, you know, there, there's some truth to that. Like in a, in a broad group-based level, the people, you know, membership in a group does predict these things. But on a, on a personal level, you can say, well, I'm not that person, you know, like there's a lot of things that make me unique, that makes me different, uh, you know, that, that would, you know, make me, you know, make me want an individualized assessment as opposed to this kind of group based. I mean, it is, it is, it is de the definition of stereotyping. It's, it's statistical stereotyping. Um, and then, of course, there's the problem of bias, you know, so no risk assessments, at least not in the last 20 or 30 years, actually literally include race as an input to the algorithms. But they all include all sorts of things that are correlated with race. Like definitionally, you know, so we can start with, um, you know, socioeconomic variables, which are common in risk assessment. By the way, you guys all have a little copy of um, Virginia's nonviolent risk assessment right there. You can take a look and see it. Some of the things that are in it, we, I'll talk a little bit more about this particular risk assessment uh, later. Um, so that one has got uh, uh, things like um, your uh, uh, your marital status. It got it's got uh, uh, is that employment or education? I can't remember right now. Employment. Got employment. It's got employment status. Um, you know, some of them have education. They have things like that, and all of these things are you know, the process of, of you know, our, our, our world that has, you know, a, a, a long history of racism, a long history of, uh, you know, socioeconomic divides and divisions that make certain groups, you know, uh, more or less likely to, uh, you know, to have these particular traits. And so that's just the socioeconomic stuff, you know, like uh, that, 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 you know, in some ways that is the, the type of predictors that people are most concerned about because it is literally directly saying, well, we should be more likely to incarcerate you because you are poor, because you are uneducated, because you don't have a, a stable job. And, it, you know, although on a statistical level, these things do tend to predict rearrest, reconviction, and all of our visible proxies of, of, um, of crime, uh, there's still, it is still directly socioeconomic. It is literally directly saying we should incarcerate you more, you know, we should Give you a longer sentence or make you more likely to be incarcerated because you're poor. Um, but then even if you take the criminal history variables that are in there, you know, these variables also come from the real world, you know, in which there's, uh, you know, kind of classic, lots of classic explicit blatant racial bias, but also structural racism and a variety of, you know, ways that racial disparities get embedded into the data so that you have two people, you know, with, that might look the same on paper, but of different races. And, you know, you, I think an, edu an educated guess would be to say that actually the Black person probably committed way fewer crimes because, uh, you know, for each crime you commit, you're more likely to be arrested if you're Black than if you're white for, you know, for a whole variety of reasons. So the data is unclean, as in the data is, is, has, has, comes from the real world. It's a product of all our, all our, our biased, uh, messy um, you know, kind of shameful history. And, and that's, uh, that's really something that's impossible to kind of like wash out of the data. Um, and then some, you know, one last thing is lack of transparency. So some of these algorithms can be kind of black box and opaque. Uh, and, uh, and that's, uh, you know, one of the, one of the levels of concerns. All right. So I wanted to, um, hand out this Virginia risk assessment to make a few points here. So first of all, we, you know, we were talking about chat GPT-3 uh, as we came in. I, you know, has everyone here heard of that? Because I hadn't four days ago, <laughs> but I've been on Twitter and that's all that I was talking about. <laughs> so it's like, just in case, you know, the point is algorithms today are doing crazy, incredible things. They're so incredibly complicated, like the processing power, the data that's going into them, the like genius level of, you know, prediction and accuracy, like it is mind blowing. Algorithms in criminal justice are not like that. <laughs> like we're not, we're not in chat GPT-3 world 
We are in, that is literally the risk assessment for nonviolent offenders in Virginia. It is a spreadsheet that gets printed out. You do a little checkbox, depending on, you know, whether the defendant has these different characteristics, you add up the points at the end and that's your risk score. So that's, that's the world we're in. Um, and there's a few reasons why kind of we're in this like, uh, uh, you know, much, much more simpler. Mod By the way, these are, they do derive from a statistical model. You know, generally, these are, are deriving from logistic regressions in which somebody takes the coefficients on the regression, converts it to an integer, and that's the risk score uh, that you see. So, you know, that's, they, you know, they multiply the coefficients by whatever scaling factor so that, you know, it's, you know, uh, young, you know, being under the age of 30 gives you 13 points or whatever. But that, that's kind of, so there is some statistics on the back end there. It's, it's simple models. And that's for a couple of, of reasons. So first of all, the data that we're working with is limited almost entirely to administrative data collected by courts and, and police. Um, and this is not, you know, in, in contrast to uh, the data like chat GPT-3, where people are generating, you know, this is, this is based on like, as far as I can understand, the entirety of the internet and the entirety of the printed language where people are generating content because that's how we live our lives. We love, you know, the way we live our lives is we generate content that which can then be processed. This is kind of like painstakingly collected data where somebody is like, some clerk is like, well, we got to put it in the system. So, you know, marking it down, this person, you know, failed to appear. Like, here's a, you know, like that's, you know, that's where the data comes from. Doesn't mean it won't ever go into the big data world that we live in but it has not yet. There are some reasons to suspect that if it does go, it might not be soon or there's gonna be pushback. Um, and then the, the last point is that the data in these tools, so again, this is socioeconomic factors, this is age, uh, gender, this is criminal record stuff. It's not by and large incredibly complex information. And what I mean by that is like, let's say take the letter um, you know, in a language model, take the letter T. The meaning that is embedded in the letter T depends entirely on what other letters is next to that T in the document. You know, what are, what are the letters that make a word? And then what are the words that are on that page? And then where did this document come from? Like, so the, the implications of what a T means is incredibly deeply, deeply contextual. You know, it's, 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 required, it, it's built on this idea of complex, interactive, nonlinear um, kind of implications of where exactly the T is and what it's surrounded by. Now, this is, again, not the case in criminal justice data. You know, it's, it's the information. There are some kind of, I'd say, interactions, like the number of prior arrests you have might have some different implications if you're 19 versus if you're, you know, 55. So there are some kind of levels of interaction, but it's not incredibly, uh, the information is not embedded in this, this deeply interactive way uh, in the same way that some other types of information is. And so, um, just kind of throwing up here a, a, a graph from, from a, a paper I like, Simple Rules for Complex Decisions. They kind of do a horse race of different models. So this is, um, the, the red is, um, I'm having trouble reading. What is it? I think red, it's not marked well right here. At least the colors are not coming through. Red is logit. Um, and then these are two different types of lasso and this is random forest. So um, random forest for those, you know, that, that are, are less familiar with these types of algorithms. Random Forest is a kind of like a workhorse machine learning model that's, that's quite good at, you know, um, uh, uh, kind of extracting information from these kind of interactive uh, nonlinear data sets. Um, Logit is like, you know, it's, it's technically a machine learning model. It's been, you know, been around for, for a very, very long time. Logit is what is used to build that risk assessment. You can see there is some information gain for sure. This is a, an accuracy measure called the area under the curve. It was around about 83% to like 88%. So there is, there is information gain if you use the more sophisticated algorithms, but it's not that much. And also, so this is the number of features, the number of predictor variables that are in there. Um, you know, like you've, you've got about, uh, I think it was 10 or so on your sheet. It kind of maxes out about five. Like five is your, you know, you, you're not getting a lot of information gain if you put more variables in. So, so there's kind of some basic kind of structural data reasons why these, these models tend to be fairly simple and why these simple models uh, tend to uh, uh, perform pretty well. Um, so all of those things, uh, plus the fact that, you know, this, the criminal justice system is like a total mess, you know, like, like we're talking technology to improve the system. Like they're using computers from like the nineties, you know what I'm saying? 
just like everything, like, you, you know, you get police officers like walking across town to the other courthouse because the, the you know, the little machine that like, you know, the, you need a signature on is broken. So they've got to walk 10 minutes to go like, do, you know, just like the whole, so, <laughs> so if you have a tool that can be printed on a PDF, you know, where somebody can do a checkbox, like simple, easy, you know, those things tend to kind of thrive in this particular, uh, particular environment. So, you know, these are some, you know, unique things maybe about criminal justice that don't apply as well to, you know, to other settings. But yet criminal justice has received a lot of attention when people are talking about algorithms in the last, you know, five, five or five or six years. And I, I think that's for a few reasons. I mean, part of it is like the stakes are just so high, you know, like we're, we're not talking about like who's going to, who are you going to get recommended to go on a coffee date with? You know, we're talking about like months or years of someone's freedom, you know, so that's part of it. And it's also, you know, despite this kind of simple setting, you know, that a lot of what algorithms have done for us, I think, and like intellectually, I mean, in terms of the, an academic community, is is really bring to the forefront some important, deep, tricky, conceptual issues that are just somehow like really brought in front of your face through the, you know, through the quantification and the formalization process of predicting risk. And so we're going to be talking about a couple of those today. And these issues, you know, we're going to, I'm going to talk about them in the, you know, in the context of criminal justice, but these issues are, are issues that really, you know, spread um, throughout, you know, and, and apply and are relevant to, to a large number of contexts in which predictive algorithms uh, are, are being used. All right. I think I already said all that stuff. Um, all right, so let's just play. Let's play a little. Would you rather game, guys? Mm -hmm. So you guys have. I'll, I'll have a moment to take a look at this. Uh, this risk assessment, right? Now I'm. I'm going to assume most of the people in here are, you know, relatively. Uh, relatively low. Is there any? Is there any men between the ages of 26 and 29 who are unmarried in the room? All right, because you know, add it up. If you're under the age of 30, you get 13 to your score, right? If you are over the age of 26 and unmarried, what is it? another? I don't have one in front of me. I should grab it. Here. Like another eight or six, you know, six points. Um, and then uh, and then if you're male, you get another eight points. So, you, you know, there, there was a decent chance I was going to get somebody in here who is, you know, getting up into the, uh, you know, very close to the high risk cutoff, which is 28, just solely on being uh, an unmarried man in this this particular age range. Um, but I'm going to assume most of the people here are in a rank relatively low, especially since we don't have any, you know, young men in this category. But what? So, you know, what do you think? Which which would you choose? You've been arrested. You've been charged. Let's just say you've been convicted. So this is a risk assessment that's used upon conviction for sentencing for groups of people that are uh, in one of these nonviolent categories so drug, fraud or larceny. You've, you've got now a drug conviction on your record, guys, or a larceny one or a fraud conviction. Who, who do you want to do in your sentence? Is it this algorithm or do you want to judge? And why? Algorithm. All right, tell me why. Tell me why. I mean, I think the, um, you know, I, I just think the algorithm is going to be better than the, the bias of the algorithm is be better off than the bias of uh, the human blood. All right, so you're you're counting on the algorithm to you know recognize you're over the age of thirty. You know you don't have a. I'm presuming at least not an extensive criminal record. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Do you get to see? Do you get to see the score before you choose, or you have to? Well, you can calculate it for yourself right here. You, so so you could you could know your score before choosing if it's gonna. Oh, you mean? Be a judge no, oh, sorry. I don't mean to imply anybody gets to choose. Nobody gets to choose. So this is a uh, this word in thought experiment. We're, thought experiment. We're just playing games. Uh, We're thinking things. Like nobody's choosing. All right, guys. Uh, <laughs> in this game, we have this game. Right? We have, in, uh, so I, I think I would use the algorithm too, but I'm not in the Irish category. So. Yeah. Uh, what factors would shift it for you? What factors might make you be like, or is anybody anybody taking the judge here? I think. All right, we got. Oh yeah, how does somebody speak to me? I don't know. I don't know what to call. Well, I read um talking to strangers by Malcolm Gladwell, and it talks about how you can, like the the judges, I don't know, like they like being in front of somebody and they see the way they act might impact their decisions. So 
I would say judge. Right. I feel like it's an act pretty like innocent and nice and everything. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're not just, you know, whatever demographic, but you're also like a, you know, a, a nice seeming person, you know, that's going to be, a, you know, we make a connection. We have a, a raised hand. All right. Hands. All right. <laughs> All right. Jeffrey, can you unmute? Um, I think you can hear me. Let me uh, comment that I would like the opportunity to also see the interaction between the judge and my lawyer to know if there's any similarity, whether they've played golf together, whether uh, we're both white males, whether he has a son my age. I mean, there's all, so many factors that can't be uh, considered on a piece of paper. Right. Good. Good point. So you know, it also depends on who this judge is, you know, and what you might have in common. I think I see in that a lot here, right? If I'm a, a 23 year old, you know, the young black man uh, who probably says that was a 23 year old young black man who grew up where I grew up, I've had a lot more interaction with the police. I would be worried that this would be biased against me in terms of actually actually drinking. How those my previous interaction with police person. Are going to predict my probability of recidivism. So I think it depends very much on who you are. Yeah, yes, agreed. Definitely depends on who you are. I mean, we're, we're a particular demographic here, and we are absolutely not the prototypical demographic that is going to have this risk assessment administered on them. You know, so there's a lot of stuff at play here, right? There's a lot of stuff at play. There's, yeah. Has anything been found, whether it's, whether it's discriminatory, like constitutional or anything, anything like that, particularly the eight points for males? How yeah. about that? Yeah. So these have been challenged in court. Um, by and large, they have not, there hasn't been any, they haven't been very successful. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, part of it is that sentencing, current, the current sentencing regime is sort of like anything goes. You know, there are not a lot, there's very, very strict rules of evidence in terms of, you know, that what can be introduced in, in your trial in terms of figuring out whether you're guilty or not. But once that, once you've, you know, gone past that phase, like, Almost everything is permissible at sentencing. Explicit, um, you know, references to race are not. But so far, and, and age is something that some people argue should not be allowed. And, and people kind of build these arguments like, yeah, you know, sentencing based on socioeconomic status should not be allowed. You shouldn't have, you know, kind of poverty indicators in there. But so far, courts have said, well, you know, but yes, these things uh, say something about, you know, the, the opportunities you're going to have, the temptations you're going to have. Uh, and so on and so forth. So, so how many points somebody get from being black if they and, and like that the same way? Uh, you mean if if there wasn't a restriction on putting race in there directly? Yeah. So that's a good. So let me let me back up. I'm going to answer a slightly different question. Then I'll return to that. So there are people right now that are arguing you need to put race into these risk assessment algorithms, mm -hmm. and the reason you need you need to is because the implications of having a prior conviction differ based on race. You know, the, like the argument I was saying in the past, if, if people's um, experiences, uh, if, if people's likelihood of developing these, you know, this criminal record hinges on race, one of the only ways to kind of wring that out a little bit is to allow race in there to adjust, you know, to say that, well, you have a black and a white person that have, you know, both of them have, I don't know, two prior convictions and a prior, you know, one prior period of incarceration, the white person probably committed a lot more crimes um, and you need race in there to be able to adjust for that. That so far that nobody's doing that in practice. This is still kind of an academic argument. Who knows if it will have any feet legally and with our current Supreme Court, that seems highly unlikely anytime soon. Um, but it, 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 right? from, from just what you just laid out, I think we know, right? Yeah, I think our best. That's a real inability to use race, which I don't understand why you would say don't. Yeah. Other than the context, it's really big. It is, it is really big. It is really big. Um, the, the, the tricky thing though, is we don't have data on crime. So like how big, is it this, this really big, this really big, that really big, you know? And so to the instant somebody gets in there and starts adjusting and saying, well, I think it's this really big, you know, you get a lot of pushback because, because you can't really defend that on. But you, but you can observe sort of how predictive are two prior incarcerations for a young black man versus a young white man on the probability they're going to. I agree. You're not going yeah. all of the people get part with. Yeah, you you can. Although what your what your target thing is still right, you're not there. arrest or you know so it's yeah. a biased target variable. But yes, exactly. You can do some some work with that. So sorry, I'm sure this is like been asked for a long time. Are things you know 
I'm from a different part of the South, but this has got to be true in Virginia as well. If you took never married bef before age 26, if you took the class of all males in Virginia uh, without a college degree, and you sorted that by race, yeah. surely marriage rates of white males versus black males is going to be higher than white males. Yeah. So is that not considered a proxy of race? Uh, so there is, proxy is used in a variety of different ways. It is certainly correlated with race. Um, one of the, to the extent that the idea of being a proxy for race gets operationalized in these statistical type analyses, the question is, well, um, does, uh, Like if you put race in there as a control variable, like mm -hmm. how much do the coefficients shift around? Right. Um, and you know, it, it does it have predictive value, uh, or how much predictive value right. does it have, kind of beyond kind of capturing whatever predictive predictive value race has? Um, you know, and and to be honest, like there's not there there hasn't been a systematic review of all of these things really? to 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 estimate the extent to which these are providing predictive information beyond beyond race there's i mean there's actually i could spend a lot more time on this and there's yeah, a very yeah, deep yeah. kind of rabbit hole we could go in but um <laughs> okay but yeah yeah um and just to circle back to your question i uh, i don't you know off the, hand, the top of my head i don't if you put like race in there as a predictor also i don't know how, what it would what it would yield but race is i mean i think there's a tendency for somebody who works with data to think of race as like a you know, a column in your data set that you can add as a, you know, into your, into your regression or into your predictor model. But race itself is going to be a, is, you know, it's a bundle of, it's a bundle of goods and life experiences. Uh, it's a bundle of, 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 you know, things that, you know, life has put you through and experiences that you've had and, and, and so on and so forth. And so um, even they're putting, like, I think that, I think there's too much attempt to try and draw clean conceptual lines between the um you know predictive uh between race as a predictor versus all of the implications of all of the things that race makes you more likely to be as a predictor sorry if that was a little gone a little bit into abstract mode but yeah so one of the things i'm thinking about one of your first slides was about um the kinds of data that can be collected was only basically the things that the law can see right. um, and you know age um arrest record marriage record these are all recorded somewhere officially race is a lot more complicated right, right. and um and so and you know of course people can be tri-racial and you know there's like all sorts right. of things right and there's no like verification system right that we have that could prove that or whatever but i'm looking at offender as a male which, yeah. you know, thinking about the fact that gender, of course, is increasingly also something that is, you know, it's it's known by birth records, but then, you know, kind of troubled as a Boolean male, female. Yeah. Um, and so I'm curious if there's conversations about that in terms of legal status or, you know, how that's working into the algorithms too. So I, so this risk assessment that you're looking. So this this one went into place. Virginia was an early adopter of risk assessment. I've, I've done a bunch of study on Virginia risk assessment. We're talking about it. This went into play in 2003. They updated it once in 2011. Like there's there's you know the, the sex offender risk assessment that was developed in like the late and trained on data from the like five a sample of like 579 individuals from the late 90s, and is still like the one they're using like. This is not a world that moves quickly. This is not a world that is at like the forefront of like cultural transformations in terms of like how gender is perceived and so on and so on. So the short answer is no. <laughs> yeah. But um, great question. All right, so let's go on. Um, so I just wanna kind of do a, a bit of a road map. You know, we've been talking, just kind of setting the stage of, of what these uh, risk assessments are. Um, and I wanted to spend the rest of the time kind of focusing on, on two questions. The first one is, what does fairness mean when it comes to algorithms? And I think this is, uh, you know, this is a, a really interesting debate and conversation that brings up a lot of questions in, in philosophy and statistics and, and, you know, ethics and morals and, and law and everything. And um, this, is, this is one, you know, the, the conversation, I think, started on criminal justice risk assessments, but it, the the takeaways really apply broadly, you know. So I, I wanted to focus on this because I think it'll be 
you know, for useful and relevant for, you know, for as people think about algorithms in, in a variety of, of domains and fields. And then the second one is, you know, this is uh, what happens when you put algorithms in the hands of humans. So, you know, uh, I started off by, by giving you this pretending you had a choice between the algorithm and the judge. Uh, the, the truth is that you have no choice and it's not a, it's not a binary, it's, it's not algorithm or judge. It's algorithm in the hands of judge, you know, so algorithms are never kind of, you're never like give the reins over to the algorithm and let them make decisions in criminal justice. That virtually never happens. It's almost always, you know, you, you develop an algorithm, you give it to a judge and the judge is able to use it with, with quite a bit of discretion. You know, they consult it, but it, they're ultimately the ones making the, the decision, which is kind of interesting because, you know, you, the, the goals of this algorithm were kind of jumping over the human, right? Getting rid of the human and their idiosyncrasies and their biases and their, you know, all, all of the mistakes that they might make. Um, when in fact, you know, the, the kind of more apt question in the, in the criminal justice space is, is, well, what happens when you give human beings these predictive algorithms? Do we get the, the good things that we had hoped would come? Do we get the bad things that we were afraid would happen? Um, kind of what does it look like on the ground? That's that's where we're going for the next. What by the way, how, how long does this run? Good. But I just so I know. Well, if we um, what did we say like till two thirty. Two thirty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If we do kind of like inter interrupt it. Yeah. All right. So I'm counting on you guys to ask me questions. Yeah. Because like I said, yeah. ask me questions. <laughs> um. All right. So this started, I think of this as the ProPublica Compass controversy. Has anyone like, was, were people paying attention to this? This is like four or five years ago, something like this. Yes, yeah, so we got like about half the, half the head, heads nodded. So ProPublica came out with this scathing report about machine bias, where they said there's software used across the country to predict future criminals and it's biased against Blacks. That was, that was the headline. This, this, uh, this report got a ton of attention. Um, and, and started what I think is a really interesting conversation with a lot of a lot of nuance. So, um, so, so the main evidence that they present here is that the black defendants who did not recidivate over a two-year period were nearly twice as likely to be misclassified as higher risk compared to their white counterparts. So, so in a more technical jargon kind of way, this is, black defendants had a higher false positive rate. Um, so Compass, meanwhile, so Compass is the one that developed this algorithm. It's a you know a proprietary company. This is uh, you know they they contract their algorithm out to different jurisdictions. This is in Florida. Compass responds saying, "Well, you know our our algorithm isn't biased. It isn't biased at all. Our, our algorithm you're using the wrong definition. By the right definition, which is predictive parity, uh, you know we're we're we're, we're perfect, perfectly balanced. So black defendants and white defendants with the same risk score had the same recidivism rates. So there's these two definitions here. We've got, you know, this uh, uh, a definition of, of bias that comes with false positive rates and, and one that comes with predictive parity. And I think it was like a moment where a bunch of people just stood back and were like, oh, well, I never really thought about that. But guess what? These two definitions are in conflict and they both feel important. And they both feel like, yes, I want both of these things, but I don't get to have both of these things with algorithms. So when two groups reoffend at different rates, uh, you know, or or have different rates of whatever the target, this is not unique to criminal justice, whatever the predictor is, when there's two rates, two kind of average rates across these, these groups, you can either have equal false positive rates. So here, black and white defendants who don't reoffend are equally likely to be wrongly classified as recidivist. By the way, recidivism just means, you know, being re-arrested or reconvicted or re-whatever it is in the future. Um, or you can have predictive parity. So predictive parity means that black and white defendants with the same risk score are equally likely to reoffend. You can't have both. And so there's a, you know, a kind of an interesting question that developed, like, what is the right one? If you can't have, first of all, like, why can't you have both? Like a part of you is like, they're both important. I want them both. Why can we truly not have both? And which one is the right one? And so I'm gonna kind of walk through uh, you know, these definitions, particularly false positive rates, so we can kind of understand a little bit more what's going on underneath the hood. I do wanna pause and say one thing here. These issues are not unique to algorithms. This is some, this is a, this is a, this is a, this is a, a function of predictions. You can use your completely subjective, you know, human subjective method of 
coming up with a bunch of predictions. This is still true. Got it. This is a, this is a, a, an aspect of prediction that I, I think had not really been well appreciated before this kind of conversation started about five years ago. The other thing is that all of this is true, even if you don't have the data problems I was talking about. Even if you know you actually had you know actual data on crime, not just these biased proxies for crime. This is not a dirty data problem. Again, this is this is kind of like a definition of 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 prediction definition of false positive rates and predictive parity problem so we're going to kind of talk through a little bit what these um what these different definitions mean and and how we can think about them um and i'm going to do that for the next uh 20 minutes or so um all right so uh predictive parity again just means that the uh risk score means the same thing for both races so if, if both black and white defendants are rated moderate risk or have a risk score of five or whatever, it means they both have a 12% chance of rearrest within the same year. So this is kind of like a, you know, a, a basic quality that you'd think a risk assessment would want, right? Like if you didn't have it, it would be a problem. It would be weird. It would be like the risk score is measuring, you know, in, in, in Celsius for one race and in Fahrenheit for the other. Like the numbers just don't make any sense. So a, a risk score of five, you know, would say mean that there's, for example, a 9% chance of reoffending for white defendants and a 16% chance of reoffending for black defendants. So predictive parity is a desirable characteristic. It's, it's practical. Like it would be weird to have a risk assessment where the probability of reoffending was different for two people with the same risk score. But I already made this, I already made the point previously, like this, this is intention with the other thing, the equal posit, false positive rates. It's practically important, but there's a separate question of like, what is fair? What does fairness mean in this context? Is it fair if this means that black non-recidivists are more likely to be falsely labeled high risk, which is what would be true if, if you don't have equal false positive rates? All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna walk through now uh, understanding false positive rates. That's gonna take I think another another second, but hopefully I'm gonna be able to provide an example that will help think about what a false positive rate it means. All right, so false positive rates are just the number of people labeled high risk who do not reoffend. So that's a false positive. If if you're labeled high risk but you don't reoffend, divided by the number of people who don't affect, don't reoffend. Um. So just talking, thinking this through real quick. What's going to happen to the numerator or the denominator? I know there's kind of be people in here with different. I feel like how many people like kind of quanti in here? Okay, numerator top, denominator bottom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what's going to happen to the numerator here? Let's start with the let's let's start with the denominator. That was easier. What's going to happen to the denominator? Is it going to go up or down? Uh, sorry, when when the uh, when the offending rate of a group goes up, is the, is the denominator going to go up or down? So, so just the number of people who don't reoffend. The offending the offending rate goes up. The number of people who don't reoffend goes down. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Now, the, the, the numerator is a little bit different, right? Because there's two things that are moving here. So there's going to be, um, the first thing is you have the number of people labeled high risk. That's going to go up, right? Because the offending rate is going up. So more people are going to be labeled high risk. Like there's, it's some, some shift to the characteristics that are, is going to make them kind of more high risk. You're going to have an increase in the number of people that are labeled high risk. And at least, as long as you at least have some of them who don't reoffend, the numerator is going to go up. All right. I feel like I'm getting some real glazed looks here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. Uh, well, the offending rate of a group increases, the numerator increases, and the denominator decreases. The big takeaway here is that groups with higher offending rates are going to be more likely to be labeled high risk and are going to have higher false positive rates. So this is this is a characteristic of you know as as your offending rate goes up as you become a higher risk as a particular group your uh, your false positive rate is going to go up. So that's just one one thing to know about false positives. Now let's walk through a little hypo here. 
Uh, so imagine that we are trying to predict who's going to be a Giants fan. We got a very simple prediction tool. Uh, so you're predicted to be a Giants fan if you live in San Francisco, and if you're predicted to not be a Giants fan if you live in Washington, D.C. So we've got a very simple algorithm with one input. The input is, where do you live? If you live in San Francisco, you are predicted to be a Giants fan. If you are, live in Washington, D.C., you are predicted to not be a Giants fan. Very simple. Um, all right. So let's let's walk through the false positive rates for this, these groups. All right. So let's say there are 100 people in San Francisco who aren't Giants fans. They're, everyone loves the Giants, but there's still 100 people in San Francisco who are not Giants fans. Um, so we've got, you know, there's a number of people who are not Giants fans. So that's the de denominator. So we've got 100 down here. Um, every single one of them is going to be wrongly classified, right? Every single one of them is going to be wrongly classified because we had a very simple rule that says if you live in San Francisco, you are a Giants fan. Everybody who lives in San Francisco that is not a Giants fan is wrongly classified. False positive rate is 100%. All right. <laughs> All right. Cool. Question? <laughs> okay, let's go on. So let's say now there are 100,000 people in Washington, D.C. that aren't Giants fans. False positive rate is, is going to be, uh, uh, you know, that it's going to have 100,000 in the, in the denominator. It's going to have zero in the top. Because by definition, we're like, you live in DC, you're not a Giants fan, right? No, you know, nobody's going to be falsely, falsely, uh, falsely categorized here. So false positive rate for, uh, for Washington people in Washington, DC is going to be zero. So we've got this situation where we've got these very disparate false positive rates, right? False positive rates for San Francisco is 100%, while the rate for uh, people from DC is 0%. Is this tool biased against? San Francisco. It's got a higher false positive rate. It is biased against San Francisco. All right. Tell me what tell you what, what, what do you mean by that? Well, if you're taking the third disparity definition bias. Uh yeah, or or the oh, sorry, or the false positive sorry, rate. False positive. Sure. But on like a gut level, are you like, this tool is messed up, man? <laughs> <laughs> Like yeah, feel okay. So you're, you're, the the measurement feels arbitrary. The 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 metric, the false positive rates. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe less so biased and more. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. On a, to a certain level. On a certain level, it doesn't make sense. The the the. I don't think anybody's gonna be like, oh, that tool is so unfair, right? Deeply biased, deeply problematic. Equal positive, you know, disparate false positive rates is is a real problem. And I, I bring this example up partly, you know, I I do think that predictive parity makes more sense as a metric of bias, but I actually don't want to pause here. Or here, let me jump ahead. Um, I don't want to leave you guys there. So I think I've made the point that false positive rates are kind of a, a problematic or like a questionable metric of fairness. But at the same time, like let's pause. If you're a black person who is like not gonna go commit crime, you've been arrested, but like maybe you didn't do it, or you know, maybe you did do it, but like you're you're changing your, you know, you turn over a new leaf, you're like really committed to walking in a straight path. And somebody comes along and tells you, you know, you're a we've we've classified you and we think you're likely to reaffect. Like that's a big deal, right? Like I don't want to trivialize. Like this is. I think there is something deeply like the equal the 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 unequal false positive rates should bring up some weird feelings. Like there is there's something that's different about this example than the weird little hypothetical example where we're talking about baseball fans and cities. Does it feel that way to you guys? And this is a genuine question. Does it feel unfair that like Black people who don't reoffend are more likely to be wrongly classified than white people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, why wouldn't that be unfair? I mean, you haven't yet defined what you mean by fairness. Right, right. Positive, but like, I mean, 
But like on a gut level, right? Like on a gut level, I mean, I think that you know, if there's any kind of differences that that are arising, they're not the differences that would be unfair. So how in in how do we reconcile that with with this example with Washington D.C. and San Francisco and being Giants fans? Like, did it feel unfair? Did that did that algorithm feel unfair to you in that context? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm always really thinking in terms of the algorithm and be concerned about fairness. So on a gut level, if there's any kind of disparity, I'm just I'm just kind of questionable. Wonder if uh, there's a problem there. Yeah. And, I mean, I guess that's just kind of how I go into it. We're talking like, what is that? Gut analysis. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say I would start off thinking that that's a problem, and then try to understand why. It's yeah. But I think the problem with the example is that unless you happen to be, I guess, from DC or the US fan, you're not going to feel like being misclassified as a giant fan is, is very charged, right? So it's just like it doesn't tap the parts of my brain that get tapped when I think about is a sentencing, you know, algorithm going to be unfair. And I think I'm still trying to, and I see your example sort of highlights it. The thing that I'm struggling to wrap my head around, I'm sitting here trying to work the math in my head, well, why does this happen, right? Um, I mean, it's just, there's just a mechanical relationship between your probability of recidivating all positive frames. I mean, am I not right about that? And, and that's the whole, that's where all the action is. If, you're, if I'm at the far right side of the distribution of the group, that group's going to get more false positives. Yeah. By, by construction, that does make me wonder about is the false positive uh, a measure we should be looking at, but I don't know how to have that discussion. It doesn't really, I think, call into question: is that a good metric of fairness or not? Right? Yeah, yeah, agreed. Yeah, but another thing you want to think about, right, is like how does the measurement change people's reaction to the system, and then the ability for the system to measure in the first place, right? So that, like, if you feel that the justice system is biased against you, that feeling, I mean, you know, the deep invalidated distrust that black communities have against the justice system is is real right because of these kinds of systems right and so then that gets fed back into the system and so it's a it's a compounding problem right right which i think in, in another way of saying that part of saying it like kind of stepping back there's a lot of different ways of thinking about fairness you know and like to a certain extent even if it kind of doesn't matter why someone thinks it's unfair if it feels unfair if it makes you feel like this system is mistreating you, you know, it feels like you're you're getting the short end of the stick, like that still matters, you know, like that still matters because it feeds back into this process where you know the um you know, there's there's an erosion of of of, of trust and uh you know and people feel pushed to the outside. Yeah. I also think an important important question is how do biases in the underlying algorithms then interact with these metrics, right? Um, does 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 bias the algorithm in the sense to deflate what it looks like in terms of the false positive? As an example, does it does it tend to inflate it? I, I, because I think that gets some of the issues in that race about trust in the algorithm, right? And actually, the algorithm is a terrible idea personally, but um, but if you're trying to re rehabilitate them or somehow uh, make them work, I, I, I think understanding how bias and interactions is important because this issue that of trusting in that race is I think is really important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that um, the the bias in the data, the problems that the data tend to inflate these issues. So it's going to tend to make look, black people look like they have a higher risk of reoffending than they actually do, because their measure of reoffending, which is rearrest or reconviction, is inflated. What is a what is a false positive? What, what is that? What is falsely increasing the predicted probability that, that young black men are going to receive a base due to the false positive rates? Is that that's going to increase, right? I'm just trying to put it to yes. that. Yeah. yeah. So any anything that you anything that would make a group look like they have a higher crime rate or you know higher our proxy for crime rate is going to increase their false positive rate. Yeah. Like, uh, you, I'm, I'm assuming you're going to get back to this, but it seems like this is begging, you know, the question, of how is this going to interact with judges when we start to look at, you know, when we put it in the hand of judges or or uh, parole board members or things like that? Is that, some, is that where you're going? 
Um, where is it? Yeah, in uh, I was going to switch gears okay. in a couple of minutes, but yeah. like we had a moment to like sit with this. It seems like it seems like that's going to be a highly right. So like if if the judge knows that it's biased, like are yeah. we going to correct that or yeah, are we going to make it worse or things like that? Yeah, so there's a really interesting paper by uh, Anna Schaffer, or Schaefer, um, who looks at, it's not risk assessment per se, but it looks at prosecutors and uh, sentencing disparities and makes the argument that um, in the last 10 years, this wasn't true, like back in the 90s or the early 2000s, but the last 10 or 15 years, prosecutors appear to be kind of dialing back trying to walk back racism that entered earlier in the system. Mm -hmm. So basically they they uh the the amount that like a prior conviction or a prior incarceration increases the sentence is less for black people than for white people, which is consistent with prosecutors being like, well, you know, if a white person has this prior conviction, that probably means more than mm -hmm. if a black person has it. Um, and she, she shows us there are kind of like different eras. You know, like I said, that in the earlier days, this is not true, but in more recent years, maybe due to turnover, due to like attention, Black Lives Matter, all these issues, uh, you know, the you know, more younger prosecutors on the bench, there is more of this kind of walking back process. Um, so I, I think it's a little bit context dependent, but you can certainly make a case that even despite all these problems with the algorithms, if judges understand these problems, they can adjust accordingly, right? In an ideal world. <laughs> Uh, you know, if, if they're uh, if they're thinking it through in, in that particular way, can it solve this dilemma? I mean, is that, well, it, like, that's the thing. So, so it doesn't solve the like. So there's a, a bunch of pieces we're talking. About. It doesn't yeah. solve the trade off between no. yeah. different uh, false positive rates and, and uh, the predictive parity thing, but it could potentially walk back the bias mm -hmm. and impact the bias data. Yeah. Can I ask you kind of a sideways question? Do you really know that? Giving longer sentences for people are more likely. Suppose we have proof, but yeah. we, we know we can predict that. Do we really know that it's that it's better for society to give people who are more likely to recidivate longer sentences? Yeah. So so thanks for uh, thanks for bringing that up. That's definitely something we're going to be talking about too. But I mean, so there's also this huge simplification that tends to go on in, in the discussion about predictive algorithms that is very relevant for criminal justice, but is also relevant beyond that. So algorithms are really good at making predictions under the same set of circumstances that the training data is in. What, uh, what they're not good at doing is saying something like, well, what if we changed the search? So, so you, you can train the data on people that were released, right? What if we changed their circumstances so that they were then incarcerated for a couple of years and then released? Because you know, you, you know that at least you're reducing crime outside of jail or prison walls during the time they're locked up. But what about afterwards? Algorithms cannot say anything about that. We are at a point like making these kind of causal inference questions are orders of magnitude more different, more difficult and different than um, than the prediction problem. And so, so so. So they're really only solving one little piece of it, which is like what they're, they're, they're giving information about what somebody would do under the interventions or the, you know, the decisions that were made previously. So decision to release, decision to put someone on probation or you know, whatever it was. Um, the question of what, how do we change outcomes by changing these different factors is really something that algorithms are not currently equipped to do a very good job at. Um, and and that's, that's a, a very weak link in the theoretical justification for that. To be a little bit more specific, you know, if it turns out that incarcerating a high risk person increases net crime because incarceration is particularly criminogenic for that person, meaning kind of like crime producing, um, you know, then then the whole like the whole game shifts. The whole the whole usage model of risk assessment shifts because if the goal is to reduce crime, you don't lock up the highest risk people. You know, you do something else. Right. I also want to put. Um, the the prediction can be used for different kinds of decisions, right? So I'm looking at the bottom of this page. It doesn't actually say, you know, if, if it's higher, then you should incarcerate them more. It says, are they recommended for alternate punishment or not? Which I'm guessing is some kind of like alternative sentence that's not incarceration. Is that right? Yeah. So this risk assessment tool in particular is used. Um, it, as a kind of one-way ratchet towards shorter sentences. That's how it was designed. That was how it was incorporated into the, the sentence guidelines 
to recommend a diversion for those who are in the lower risk categories. Doesn't mean it has to be used in that direction, uh, but this, you know, this, there's, they're almost always adopted with some recommendations for what sentence or bail amount or whatever to give that person. But I mean, you don't necessarily have to uh, incapacitate people more. You could, you could take it the other way. But yeah, you can. You can. Although there is a little bit of a, there is a, like a flip side of, you know, this one is articulates itself as being about. If, if, it, if it takes the status quo as risk as, you know, sentencing behavior before a risk assessment, it's supposed to reduce sentences. But by, by saying these people should not be incarcerated, you're by definition saying, well, these people should be, you know, like proceed as normal. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. So. All right. Um, so anyway, the, just to sum up real quickly, um, you know, there's there's a lot of fairness is, is an incredibly complicated question, you know, both because of these different kind of statistical definitions, and because of different contexts, you know, making something what what makes something feel unfair when you're talking about baseball is very different from when you're talking about you know race and where the stakes are incarceration as opposed to um, you know some sort of supportive services or or a benefit that they wouldn't have uh, achieved otherwise. Um, so I uh, you know have a um, I'm going to just quickly breeze this. A lot of the conversations about the fairness of the algorithm itself. That's what we've been talking about. These, you know, the these characteristics of the algorithm. But there's other other important things too, which is um, I call it system fairness. So how the algorithm is used within the criminal justice system. Is it used to, you know, increase release or offer supportive services, or is it used to kind of push towards more incarceration? And then procedural fairness, which is you know these. Uh, what's the process for developing the risk tool? Who's included in this process? Is it transparent? Is there a um, So it's it's a, a super interesting, deep, complicated topic. Um, and uh, I am now going to switch gears and talk about the other question that I wanted to spend some time with, which is something I've done a lot of research on, which is um, what happens when you put algorithms in the hands of people. So we're going to talk about like what literally how, you know, what we've got these this controversy of these algorithms you know different theories that push in different directions in terms of is it going to bring great things is it going to give great problems is it going to bring a little bit of both and we're gonna have to talk about trade-offs um so uh here we go so there's been you know for many many years the consensus was risk assessment is bringing great things um, not that they're perfect, you know, they're flawed, they can be inaccurate, they can be all this stuff, but they're better than judges. I am, um, this is, here's a, a lit review, goes back to papers from the 60s and the 70s, where they're comparing what they call clinical predictions to actuarial predictions, which means human versus machine or algorithm in kind of more modern language. Um, and, and a number of people did these sentencing simulators, these, these, uh, these simulations, policy simulations and sentencing or whatever, where, you know, the, the failure rate, your failure rate is domestic violence, obviously a very important very topic, could be cut nearly in half. Uh, you could reduce crime by 15 to 25% without affecting jail rates. Um, so, you know, there was a lot, there's been a lot of kind of like groundwork being very optimistic about, um, about what risk assessments are going to bring. But up until relatively recently, almost no uh, research on, on what they actually do bring in practice. So let's talk about two papers today. Um, one of this, this is this is a paper. It's brand new. It hasn't even kind of come out yet. The little pieces of it in um in an earlier draft that you know then got cut out and had its own kind of birth. So this is about the sex offender risk assessment in Virginia, which looks you know looks kind of like this. Got some different different things on it, some different weights, but it's similar kind of in its nature. Except the sex offender risk assessment was designed to be a one way ratchet towards higher sentences, so longer sentences. In particular, um, all right, so here is here is the sentencing guidelines uh, like cover page that will be given to a judge. And what you can see down here is depending on your uh, risk classification level, the upper bound of your guidelines recommended sentence increases by up to 300%, 50%, 100%, or 300%. So this is a one-way ratchet to push towards longer sentences for people convicted of rape or sexual assault, uh, who also get, get rated as, as high risk. Um, all right, so we've, we've talked about this a little bit, which is that um, 
algorithm adoption is more than predictions. It's predictions that get incorporated within a, a sentencing framework or a decision making framework. And that incorporation involves a number of no, both normative decisions about like what's the kind of what's the right you know what what are the goals we're trying to maximize and what uh what are the what are the things that we should care about what should be our values but also positive judgments meaning like how do we what what is our incarceration's impact on recidivism going to be is it net criminogenic is it net uh kind of prime reducing um and and all of these things you know make the the impact of risk assessment on the ground you know complicated and, and at least somewhat context dependent. All right, so um, so I'm going to start by showing uh, showing one thing right here. So this is this is a graph that shows this is the sex offender risk score on the horizontal axis. This is the probability of being incarcerated on the vertical axis. And those who score 28 or above right here are in one of the higher risk categories. So I wanted to I bring this up for, for two reasons. So first of all, there's like a big jump up in the probability of being incarcerated that coincides with this high risk classification. Now, maybe that's not surprising. So one thing we learned is that judges are paying attention to the risk score or the risk classification of this. You know, being in this high risk category, which has the expanded upper range of the, the guidelines recommended sentence, corresponds with a higher rate of incarceration and longer sentences. The other takeaway here is like, that's really arbitrary. Like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Like, that shouldn't be our goal. People who are on either side of this cutoff are really similar, right? Like 27 and 28, you know, you're kind of not that much, not that different. You might be a little bit younger, a little bit longer criminal record, a little bit whatever characteristics shift a little bit as they do kind of as you move along this, this thing, but nothing that would support like a large jump and a very large difference in sentencing across this margin. Has anybody brought an equal protection case yet over this picture? Uh, not over this picture. That's an interesting. I would think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think mean, it's a pretty hard to like clear violation. Oh. Not to get the equal protection. I guess it's. I don't know enough about equal protection law to know that I have a strong opinion about that, except that I generally think that like there's all kinds of arbitrary stuff that seems to get by. <laughs> but it, it is it is deeply, I mean there, there's there's no rational basis <laughs> for this. So <laughs> you would think it would fail a rational basis review. Um all right, so all right, so so this is I'm presenting this partly to show that judges do use the risk assessment, but also partly to emphasize the fact that once it gets incorporated into a, you know, into a sentencing recommendation schema, some weird things happen. You know, we get these classifications, we get these weird discontinuities, like it's not, uh, you know, it's it's kind of a, not a perfect system. Yeah. You know why they go for that? They, they just want a one zero. I they think the designers of these things feel like a, a one zero algorithm is Sort of more effective for the judge than telling them that it's a continuum? So that's a really good question. Risk assessments are almost always given in the form of crude classifications. You know, so you're you're low, moderate, and high risk, you're a one, two, three, four, five, six. So in Virginia, you have both um they can both see the numbers go from I think zero to I can't remember what it is exactly, maybe 80 or 90. You can see the actual number. You can see whether the person is in level one, two, three, or level zero in the risk score, but you don't get any statistics. You don't, no, you don't, you don't say like, oh, this corresponds to a, a six percent chance of recidivating within the next, you know, ten years or whatever it is. Like, they are almost never used, and I think there's two reasons behind that. One is, uh, well, one might be just well, we, you know, it's it's sort of simpler to administer. Part of what is going on here is we want to nudge judges towards different decisions, and that that might be easier. Another thing is, to be quite frank, so the sex offender risk assessment, it's supposed to predict sexual reoffense. Those rates are so incredibly low. They started predicting any against person reoffense, but those rates are still really low, guys. <laughs> They're still quite low. I don't have, they include misdemeanors. I don't have misdemeanors in my data, but the rates of like future sex offense within uh, uh, eight years, the average is 2%. 
two percent of people are convicted of a new felony sex offense within eight years of release. It's higher with the against, but but it might be partly just like they want to like hide that information from judges. But like it's it's hard to you know. Uh, yeah, that's a really common false impression. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, there are, there is a there is there are individuals who recidivate at high rates, but by and large, they're they're low. You're talking about within same offense versus recidivism, right? Like recidivism, or just within uh, within a, the bracket of sex offense, yeah. Within, yeah. Of those know. who've been convicted, yeah. yeah, and incarcerated or just convicted, uh, just convicted. That's also going to be the fault. Also, it's going to be crazy high as well. Oh, yeah. Yep. The base yourself. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So, so, once again, they use the risk assessment. It's a one way ratchet. It's designed to be a one way ratchet towards longer sentences. Guess what, guys? The net impact went the other way. <laughs> it led to a net decline. For those that are going to know what I'm talking about, this is a dynamic difference in differences graph where you're comparing sex offenders to non-sex offenders kind of before and after the reform. This is like the date of the reform. For everyone else, the thing I want you to see is like, oh, sentences went lower <laughs> after the reform for sex offenders. So the, um, the net impact of the sex offender risk assessment was the absolute opposite from what the legislature intended and from what somebody might expect given a kind of like look at the, the sentencing scheme and what was supposed to happen. So, weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, have you tried, I'm not trying to get enough, I'd love to see the 10% on the 90%. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, yeah. did you see, I mean, you saw a drop in the average sentence. Yeah. Probably saw a drop in the median sentence. I wonder if you saw an increase in the 90% of the sentence. In other words, you've got that boundary, you're getting yeah. that limit. Yeah, I, the, the sample is not super large here um, of, of sex offenders. The, the number is a little bit small, but I'd be curious too. I haven't actually looked into that. Um, all right, so let's talk about this a little bit. And maybe this might be, we'll see. This might be the last thing. I have more stuff to do to talk about if you want to, but. Um, all right, so we have this like, this instrument is supposed to be a one-way ratchet towards longer sentences, led to a net decline in incarceration. The first thing that I want to emphasize is that this is not an information story. Like this is not because judges have more or different information about recidivism. At least that, that's that's what I'm going to argue. So first of all, this just you know the, the risk assessment says nothing about the actual statistical probability of of a future against person crime or sex crime. You know what you get is this person is a 27 and is in the lowest risk category. Right? So it's not giving any statistical information from which you could be like, oh, I guess rape offenders have, have a lower risk of recidivism than I thought previously. Um, one other thing, it, it also, uh, I, think I, I don't think I wrote it up here, but um, I, no, I'm going to leave that aside for a second. Um, Maybe, do, you know what, do you know what percentage of people are being categorized in the different risk levels, right? So, like, what percentage? Of yes. Yeah, so a little bit more than half, like 55 to 60 percent, are in the lowest risk category. So one thing that I want to emphasize is that, like, there definitely there there should you would expect some of what you said, like the 90th and the 10th percentile kind of divergence. Like there should be some people they use the risk assessment. We saw that in that little graph that I showed previously. But to the extent that they increase sentences for those in the higher tail, they increase they decrease them more for those, you know, presumably in the lower tail. Of the risk distribution, and I'm going to offer one potential uh, explanation. Obviously, we don't um, uh, we don't know what you know what actually happened. Um, this is something that judges brought up to us in you know when we were interviewing them. Like we're not kind of completely making this up out of thin air, but I, I think it's it's one thing to think about, which is that the risk assessment kind of kind of like shields judges a little bit from from blowback. Or from guilt. I'm not saying it's all external. You know, again, it's like a second. Can you imagine the pressure on a judge? Like, you know, the, what that must feel like to make these decisions with such huge stakes. Like, I imagine it's extraordinarily stressful. And even if you've been doing it for a while, there still is 
you know, you still question if, and if, if you release somebody and they go on to do something terrible, like how awful you would feel, not to mention the, you know, the, the blame that you might get, <coughs> getting flashed all over the news, so on and so forth. So all of a sudden you have this risk assessment that says, well, 55 to 60% of these, you know, these rape offenders are actually low risk. It might, it might kind of give you this sense of like, okay, I've got this second opinion now. It's not just my feeling. You know, I used to be kind of like erring on the side of caution, erring on the side of caution, but now I've got something that says this person is in the lowest risk category. I feel more comfortable now giving them a little bit of a break, being a little bit less harsh than I would have been on them otherwise. Um, you know, so kind of it counter, counterbalances this other tendency in, you know, when it comes to decision making for a judge to be conservative because when you make the type of error that results in somebody being released and going on to commit crime, that's the type of error that's very visible. You know, it's very salient, it's very visible. You know what happens, you feel it, people might be blaming you for it. You know, it, it, it does become, you know, it can go in the news, become a political thing. The other type of error, incarcerating somebody who wouldn't have done anything if you released, you never know. That type of error is not visible. You never know what somebody would have done if they were released. And there's nobody, there's, you know, by and large, there's not people being like, you gave that guy a long say, you wouldn't have done anything. There's not the kind of same media pressure or public pressure, um, you know, that, that works in that, that same direction. Um, so, so maybe the risk assessment counters that pressure a little bit. It, it can result in this, in this shift towards, towards lower sentences. Let's take a little pause here. Like we're at an hour and 15. We'll have, we'll have questions or comments or, yeah. What type of election pressure do these judges get? Are these, are these elected yeah. or are they appointed? They're not, they're, they're appointed by the legislature. So it's. So they, Face some sort of political pressure, but not yes. populism. Right. Yeah. Are they what? No, they're eight year appointments. I had a similar question, which was Did you have a temporal access to that? Um, so you, you had it tracked by fiscal year, where there are variations um, that, that corresponded to, you said they're all appointed or they elected? They're, they're appointed. The legislature elects them, but not like kind of a popular election. So were there, were there, I don't know if you think were there variations like harsher during early years of appointment uh, or, or like yeah. versa, um, any, any sort of correlation that, that had to do with, with their time in all on the bench? Yeah, so I've, I've, um, I haven't looked at this in this paper. It's something other people have studied, and they do tend to see a kind of a, a, a more more longer sentence, harsher punishment, right up for you know, right up right before an election. Yeah. Um. So that's I think something that's been established in him. Yeah. We have an audience question. Yeah. From Jeffrey Pollard. Jeffrey, you can hear you. One of the reasons I might suspect that the judges were less severe after this happened, um, similar to the comment that they had some cover, was because they resented being told what to do. Judges love to have discretion. And if they're given some parameters uh, by the legislature um, to check and balance, then they're going to be like, I'll show you. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm, a, I'm sympathetic to that too. I, I, you know, I, there could be a variety of different things, but I, there is definitely truth that there is this tension in risk. So in addition to everything else we talked about, risk assessments have been implemented as a kind of top-down method of control, pseudo-control, because you're not really controlling everyone because judges ultimately have discretion in the end. But it's a way that, you know, kind of the legislature or, you know, sentencing commission or whatever kind of body that is at the top, sometimes even kind of the, you know, the uh, the Supreme Court will, will try and implement different policies, harsher sentences for sex offenders, you know, shorter sentences for these nonviolent offenders. And I, I think there is res resistance <laughs> to that kind of those sorts of nudges from the top that, that could certainly be part of the story. Yeah. I'm interested again in the, um, the way that the perception of measurement changes the measurement itself. 
And so like when you're talking about the reform, I'm curious, I'm assuming you say one way ratchet towards higher sentences, sex offense is an extremely offensive offense to the public. And so a legislature who's putting forth some sort of reform and saying, you know, we're tough on crime, we're tough on this, you can tell really horrible stories about that, right? And then, but that, but I'm thinking about like Randy's perception, which I think I've shared too, about, you know, recidivism is like a popular perception, right? So that's the sort of thing that gets people reelected. I'm tough on sex offenders, right? Nobody wants to be easy on sex offenders. And so that kind of, like, if that pushes the um, legislation in the first place, and then actually, you know, it's just interesting that it then changes the offense or the, um, the sentencing, but in the opposite direction. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right. Um, I feel like people are kind of, I've got more, but like we're nine minutes. I feel like people are, maybe attention span is done. Um, <laughs> it is an hour and 20 minutes. Should, should we call it quits here? Do we want to keep talking or do you want me to keep going and saying? All right. <laughs> Let me see if I can condense the rest of my talk into nine minutes. <laughs> All right. So I want to quickly go over one other instance of risk assessment being adopted. And yeah. Get some coffee, get some sugar in your body. It's like, you've been sitting a long time. So this is a different paper. This is about this risk assessment, the nonviolent risk assessment. This is originally all one paper, but you know, you can like cram so much in stuff. Um, and this risk assessment goes the other direction. So it's a one-way ratchet for shorter sentences. It's only uh, designed to identify some people who otherwise would have been incarcerated to either give them shorter jail sentences or to release them entirely. Um, this is the same graph I showed previously, but this is with the nonviolent risk assessment. Once again, you see that this classification results in this discontinuity in sentencing. You know, I, I use this to, you know, present the idea that uh, both that um, you know judges are responding to the risk classification, but it does create some arbitrary discontinuities, some arbitrary gaps. Um, this is a kind of another way of evaluating if the, the risk assessment had an impact. This is um, an event study design. It basically just shows that the correlation between sentencing and, and risk increased after the risk assessment was adopted. Another way of saying they had some impact, like, you know, judges are paying attention to it. It's not just immediately getting treaded and flushed down the toilet because judges are ornery and don't like these new things. Um, but there was no net change in sentences. So before, we saw that a risk assessment designed to increase sentences led to a decrease. Here, there's a uh, risk assessment designed to decrease sentences that had kind of no average impact on sentences. What I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you kind of a similar dynamic differences and differences graph where you kind of see the, the, the trend. Um, I'm going to show two of them, though. The one on the right is going to be what actually happened. You'll see kind of like basically a flat line. The one on the left is going to be the simulated, like a, a simulated impact of what would have happened to sentencing in the absence of discretion. So if judges had just kind of followed the risk assessments, nudge and automatically released uh, low risk individuals, what you would have seen is like a big drop in uh, here. I think this is it's the sentence length with the arcs into transform, but just think of it as the sentence length with where you can interpret the numbers. Um, so a big, a big drop in sentencing if they had followed the risk assessment. Instead, human discretion meant no change, right? So they did, you know, that's why I kind of started off trying to be like, okay, they did use it at least somewhat, right? We see this discontinuity for people that are right on the, you know, right above and right below this risk classification. We saw that the correlation between sentencing and the risk score increased after risk assessment was adopted. But again, there's this push and pull. Like, so to the extent that they were more likely to divert low risk individuals from jail or prison, there was a counter push where they were more likely to, uh, more likely to incarcerate or give longer sentences to people uh, in, in the higher risk score. So, so it's again, like a, a failed nudge. It was a nudge towards decarceration because there was a big overcrowding problem in the prisons, uh, which, which was not, not successful because judges didn't, they used it off label. They didn't use it in the way that they were folks supposed to um, by the judge. So next thing we're gonna look at is what factors predict deviation from the risk score. So what I'm gonna do here is just kind of 
run a regression where I'm controlling for the risk score, the exact risk score, I'm controlling for the guidelines recommended sentence. And then I'm just saying, okay, what factors predict whether they're going to sentence more harshly than other people with the same risk score and the same set guide, the same recommended sentence, or more leniently than other people that are the same. Um, and these are the, the different colors are just minor variations on the specification. What you see is that they are, tend to be more strict on black people, more harsh on black people than on a, so, so this is, this is the opposite of what we would expect if judges were compensating for this idea that these risk assessment tools are supposed to be biased, right? So if, if judges were like, oh, they get the data is biased, uh, you know, I, I think the risk towards inflated for black people because of bias in our system, they would be more lenient. They'd counteract that. That is absolutely not what we see. So they're, they're more harsh. Yeah. So when, when all, like, on all of those, you have data about the before and after the risk came to the place. Yeah. Are you able to construct an estimated value of what the risk assessment would have been for folks who are sentenced before the risk assessment is actually in place? Oh, yes, I am. Because it would be, I would love to see you do this regression for before uh, yeah. the yes, yes, yes. Exactly. And show me if the if the if the risk assessment has increased or decreased. I'm gonna show you uh, that I'm gonna okay. show you essentially that in a second, not in this one. But so I mean, the other thing that I really want to show you is that, that there's this, they're, they're much more lenient with young people. And this is, I think this is important because take a look at this score. Like there is nothing that gives you more points than being under the 30. It gives you the most, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it gives you dramatically more points than having fire, five prior adult incarceration. Gives you more uh, uh, more points than having both adult and juvenile felony convictions reduced. Like young age is the most important predictor in all of these risk assessments. Like you should think of it as age plus a little bit of extra stuff. Like that's what these these are simple algorithms. That is an incredibly strong correlation between uh, age. And, how do I get two more minutes? <laughs> so, uh, but but there's this tension between do we. If we want to incarcerate those at highest risk of reoffending, you throw the young people in jail and don't let them out till they're 30, right? But that's obviously not what we want, right? Like there's a lot of other reasons why you might want to be more lenient on young people, you know, like they're they're less culpable, they're just like their heads aren't screwed on straight, their brains are still developing. Like there's a lot in our system that pushes us towards more leniency based on these other rationales beyond incapacitating those at highest risk of reoffending. So this is an example where an important predictor of future offending kind of pulls in, in, in both ways. You know, it, the risk assessment rationale is lock up those at highest risk of reoffending. So this would be an aggravator, young age would be an aggravator, but judges are saying, mm -mm, I, you know, I'm not comfortable with being so strict on young people. This is, this is too much, this is too much. Uh, all right, so um, the, the gist of the story is that this is the simulated sentence. If judges use their discretion to mitigate some of the impacts on young people, not entirely, like it still had, uh, sorry, still had some, still led to an increase in sentences for young people relative to the older people, but not as much as it would have in these simulations of in the absence of discretion. Uh, and then uh, one last thing I want to say about, uh, I think the last point I'll make right here is, is to do with racial disparities. When you think about risk assessments impact on racial disparities, there's a lot of moving parts here. There's a lot of things, there's disparities in the algorithm and there are large racial disparities in the algorithm, even though race is not included because a lot of the things included in there are racial correlates. There is, as I showed you, disparities in use, where even though Black people kind of have on average higher risk scores than, than white people, judges are then, you know, treating them more harshly than white people with the same risk score. But then there's this other important question. It was like, what were they doing before risk assessment? How much racial disparity was there before risk assessment? And if this is really big, these things can also be big and it won't necessarily have an impact. Got it? So this is kind of like how you think about risk assessments impact on racial disparities. And, and the short answer is that they're, they're really, you know, this is not a statistically significant effect. There is maybe a little bump up. Um, it's not, I can't rule out, a, you know, a, a small to moderate size increase, but it's not statistically significant. And same thing, kind of not so much with, with the simulations either. Um, and this is 
a little bit sensitive also to different ways of defining the simulation where the other ones are not. So uh, I think I'm at time, um, but that's that's kind of the, the gist of that paper. And uh, thank you guys so much for a fun conversation. Well, I'm just going to